Hey everybody, welcome back to another very exciting Adobe Live. I am your host, Jesus Ramirez. Welcome to another Pro Tips sec uh, segment. In this episode, we're going to talk about creating realistic reflections with the generative fill in the Photoshop beta. And actually, let me refresh my page because I wanted to see who is in the chat. I can't see the chat yet. And I wanted to say hi to you guys. I see a lot of people in the chat. Susan, Robert, Rick. Thank you so much for joining me. Anika, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Um, feel free to leave your comments and questions on the chat. I'll be checking the chat as we go through this stream. Um, for those of, of you that don't know me, my name is Jesus Ramirez. I work as a, a finisher in the Hollywood industry, creating movie posters. I also run a YouTube channel called the Photoshop Training Channel, where you can learn how to use Photoshop. And everything that I teach usually has the context of how I would do something professionally. So that's why I love doing these pro tip segments here on Adobe Live. Hey, clever. Uh, Burn, good to see you. Gareth, Sean, good to see you as always. Um, why don't we switch over to my screen so we could um, start working on today's uh, segment. By the way, this is my YouTube channel, uh, which I just mentioned, Photoshop training channel. Make sure to follow me on Behance and you can see some of the work that I've done. I've done work with CBS, HBO, most recently the Discovery Channel. But um, this is the Photoshop beta. By this point, I imagine that a lot of you are familiar with how to get to the Photoshop beta. And if you don't, no worries. You can go into the Creative Cloud um, app on your desktop app under beta apps here. You'll see the Photoshop beta. So the Photoshop beta is the version of Photoshop that currently has the generative fill options available. And what we're going to do today is learn how to create reflections in how, and how to combine them with your photos to create very realistic results. And you know what? I was just telling uh, CJ, who's producing this show, like when I teach, I often think of like ideas on the fly to show you guys. And even though this has nothing to do with reflections, I thought it'd be cool and I thought you guys might enjoy it. So let's take care of that first and then we move on to reflection. So uh, something very cool that you can do with an image like this one is distort it to change the angle of the room. And I always recommend changing your layers into smart objects when possible so that you can work non-destructively. A smart object is a container that can hold one or more layers and you can apply non-destructive adjustments, distortions, filters, and transformations. In other words, you can always come back and make changes to them. So I recommend converting layers to smart objects when possible. Sometimes it's not possible for various reasons, including uh, bloating your file, making huge files, or maybe you're somebody who uh, paints often on a layer, then that wouldn't work with a smart object. But besides that, most other things, you should convert your layers to smart objects. And now that I have a smart object, I can go into edit and choose puppet uh, perspective work, excuse me, perspective warp. And that will bring up this grid that we can create simply by clicking and dragging. So I can click and drag on this um, over this image and I can now use the grids to match the perspective of this image. By the way, I'm holding the Alt key on Windows, that's the Option key on the Mac, and scrolling down on my mouse wheel to zoom out as I do this because I want to make sure that these lines align with the room. You don't have to be precise, but you know, you kind of have to get them close to the actual perspective. And this seems pretty good. Also make sure that you cover the entire entirety of the image. And then I can click and drag from the other side. And when that blue highlight appears, you can just release your mouse button and Photoshop will automatically merge and snap this edge into place. And you only have to worry, worry about this side. And again, Make sure that these lines more or less follow the perspective of the room, like so. And actually something um, I wasn't keeping in mind because I was talking and, and teaching, I also needed to keep the floor in, its, uh, in a different plane. So I have to move these up and make sure that these now match. So I missed that part because I was, I was talking. Sometimes as you teach, you kind of miss a few steps because you're trying to remember what to tell people. But anyway. So now I've managed to create a plane for either side of the wall. I don't have to create one for the ceiling. I guess I could if I really wanted to, but in this case, it's not really that important. And I'll now create a plane for the floor. So notice that again, once I hover and, and click over the image, it highlights in blue. 
snaps into place and I can go and do the same thing on the other side. Highlights, snaps into place when I release and I can now match the perspective and I need to cover the entire image. So I need to now move it away further like so and maybe uh, zoom out a bit more again by holding Alt on Windows option on the Mac. And the perspective here is pretty good. It's not 100% perfect, but that's okay. It it looks good enough and it matches pretty good. At this point, you can click on warp. Here's a keyboard shortcut you'll probably never use in your life, but I'm a nerd, so I remember all the keyboard shortcuts. There's actually a keyboard shortcut to switch between the layout and the warp, and that is the L key on Win uh, L key of both Windows and Mac, the L key for layout and the W for warp. So see, notice as I press the L and W key, I switch between layout and warp. So you can press the W key if you want to remember it, go ahead, or you can just click on warp. And once you do that, you can hold shift and click on one of these edges and they'll turn yellow. And that means that you can move two points at the same time. But notice how now I can rotate the room. See how the room is rotating now? So now it looks like this room has an entirely different perspective. See that? And you can, of course, keep manipulating this image until you get something that that works for you so we can just keep making adjustments and now we have a room that is rotated to the other side i'll click on the check mark to commit the changes again we're working with a smart object and you can click on this icon here to see the difference see how we just completely changed the perspective of the room just by making those adjustments you don't have to do this but i have it that i have now is that I select any layer mask that I'm not using and I just delete it. That way um, I don't get confused. It declutters the layers panel and I don't accidentally paint on it with black to hide something. So I, if I'm not using it, I delete it. So now you might be thinking, well, this is cool. The room is rotated, but we have a lot of this extra space. What do we do? Well, you can make selections like so and then use generative fill to fill in those areas. So I'll click on generate or fill, click on generate, and it'll generate an area to fill that uh, area. Let me look at the chat while that's generating just so I can see if there's any new, any questions. Um, cool, hey Robert, how's it going? Marco, good to see you. Awesome, Carol says mind blown. Yeah, let me know in the chat if you like that trick. Um, I, I always like to know if what I show is relevant to people, so just let me know. Um, and I'll continue just filling in these areas. It looks like a misspacer, spacer, but that's okay. Not a big deal. I can just now make a selection here and do another generator fill and click on generate. Something that I recommend doing when working with uh, generator fill is that if you're going to use, like for example, like this, right? Where like the ceiling and the wood or um, I don't really need all the variations. I don't really need to keep it as a gen fill layer, I'd recommend merging it. It just makes the file size much smaller. So I'll just select these two layers and I'll press Control E on Windows, that's Command E on the Mac to merge the layers. And there you go. Like I, I was never gonna like do anything else. And actually, to be honest, I don't like that last variation. So let me undo that and then maybe choose a variation I like better like that one. Um, but anyway, I'll merge these two. Same keyboard shortcut I just mentioned, Control E and I can now use the remove tool and then just fix that little spot there. Perfect. So now we have a room that is completely different than the original. So now let's talk about creating reflections in the generator fill. So one of the things that you can do with gen fill, and by the way, I'm not lucky, like I think I stretched this a little bit too much and that's like really bothering my eyes. So I'm just gonna crop it out a little bit so it's not so obvious that it's like, super stretched out, but I, I'm going to get more of that floor there. That's good. Cool. There you go. Um, one of the things that you can do is obviously create objects, right? So for example, in, in this room, I could create a couch. We're going to create a couch in this space here. And that might be a little small. So let me just add to the selection. And by the way, the, the shape of your selection matters when you're working with Genfill. If you haven't seen my tutorial on that, I have a tutorial on my YouTube channel on how all this works, but the selection does influence the generation. I'm going to click on generator fill and I'm just going to type orange couch. Why orange? Well, the room is blue and it contrasts well with orange. So that's why I chose orange. And what I'm going to do now is wait for this couch to generate. And 
there it is. We have a couch. And notice how the lighting, perspective, and everything matches, right? But if I change my mind and I want to have a reflective floor, maybe I want to make it seem like this is a very clean floor, like what do I do? Well, we can create a reflection with Gen Fill. All you need to do is, with the polygonal lasso tool, make a selection around the floor like so. And it makes this selection. And from the generative fill option, you can type in the word mirror and click on generate. I just saw a very interesting question in the chat with Robert. Robert mentioned, Jesus, have you tested gen fill with Spanish prompts? Yes, I have. Not publicly. Actually, it'll be public soon. I'm working on a project with Adobe where some of my videos are going to appear on the Adobe website using gen fill. And I try it a prompt in Spanish. So I've done it a couple of times, but yeah, um, I haven't used it extensively, so I don't know if, you know, how to compare it. I just used it for a couple of things and it seemed to work well. And of course, when we're live, nothing works perfect. And this is not exactly what I want. So I'm going to click on generate again. Um, in all my trials prior to this, it generated a mirror over the entire floor. Um, and of course, you know, when things are alive, they don't work as they should, but I did save the file just in case. And I will switch over to it if it doesn't work. Um, this is working a little. Oh, here we go. That that one. Oh, did I not do a complete? Oh, yeah, I didn't complete the selection. Okay, that's probably why it didn't work. That was my mistake. Um, so I'm going to make sure I go over the entire area here. And then I'm at, I have the top layer selected. So the mistake was that I was I selected this layer here, the couch layer. So then this other layer didn't allow me to see the rest of the reflection. So make sure you have the topmost layer select uh, layer selected when you do this and then click on generative fill and type the word mirror. Um, Robert's saying that it works very well with Swedish. Swedish. So yeah, let us know in the chat um, if you know how well it works with other languages. And he was asking, when does that release? Jesus, I don't, I'm assuming you're talking about the videos that I just mentioned. I'm not really sure, Anika, that's on Adobe. I'm done with the videos, so I don't know when Adobe is going to publish them. So keep your eye out for them. They'll be on the Adobe website. And if you follow me, I'll, I'll mention it. Um, but anyway, so now we have a reflective floor. See how we, we have a reflective floor. And it, it matches pretty well. The, the you know, it's not 100% perfect, but it's much better than anything you would have been able to do by hand, definitely much faster. If you're unhappy with your results, you can always click on generate again and it'll give you another result. I'm happy with this second one. I'm just showing you that you can keep generating until you get something that you're happy with. And now that um, as soon as this finishes, I'll be able to work with either one of the new ones that I don't really like that much. So this one is the best. Tip, you can click on this trash icon to delete the variations that you don't like. That way you don't bloat your file and you only keep the ones that you are going to use. So there we go. We have a reflection on our floor, but obviously it's not blending well with the layer below. So what we're going to do now is take this new gen fill technology and apply it to our photo using old school Photoshop techniques. And you probably guessed it. We're going to use blending modes. Blending modes are divided by categories and you can see these little lines here right here. And for reflections, I recommend using the blending modes in the light category because they hide dark pixels and only keep the bright ones, bright ones, creating the illusion of a reflection. Uh, in this case, I could go for either screen or maybe linear dodge add. I kind of like the intensity of linear dodge add better. So I'll select that. Now, the, the thing about linear dodge add is that it's one of eight blending modes. It gives you different results when you reduce opacity compared to fill. And if you want to know more about what that is, oops, sorry about that. If you want to learn more about what that is, then you can go to my website at photoshoptrainingchannel.com, Blending Modes Explained, and you can see this write-up that I did. I wrote everything I know about Blending Modes. It's got a bunch of shares. People have been really enjoying it. But the point is, is that you can learn everything you want to possibly would want to know and more about Blending Modes. And I talk about the eight special blending modes, including linear dodge add. These are the blending modes here. And those blending modes um, have two special options that the other ones do not. They act differently when you adjust fill compared to opacity. And if you uncheck transparency shapes layers, the blend is different on the edges, which we don't need to worry about in this case. But that's one of the differences. And you can read about that in that article. But. I can see in the chat that 
Oliver says, wow, that's a very well polished floor. And that's exactly what I am going for. A very well polished floor, but I don't, that's too intense for me. So what I'm going to do is just reduce the intensity a little bit by reducing the fill. Again, I'm using fill because this is one of the eight blending modes that acts differently when you reduce opacity compared to fill. And in my opinion, fill tends to look better with these eight blending modes. And you can just adjust it accordingly. Also, to make it more realistic, you can double click to the side of the layer here and use Blend Div. Blend Div allows you to show or hide pixels based on their values. So with underlying layer, you can bring up pixels that are either dark or bright. So underlying layer here, I can drag this black point to the right and notice how the darker pixels just stop coming. They come up. See that? See how they come up? So this is going to help me create a better reflection because in the real world, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't show so many reflections here in the back and definitely not in the darker areas in between the panels. So I can hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac and click to split this in half and create a smooth transition between visible and invisible pixels. And you can adjust it accordingly. And I'm going to move this over to the right a little bit because I don't want the darkest pixels, like the deep shadows back here, to have a reflection. So I only want the reflection in the brighter areas and definitely don't want them in those, uh, you know, the edges in between the panels. And I can just keep adjusting this until, you know, things look good to my eye. I'm going to be a little heavy handed in this example, just so that you guys can see the reflection, but probably I would minimize this in a real project, but I'm going to be heavy handed. Um, I'll press OK and you can see the result. Now, I generated a couch that doesn't have the reflection, so I'm just going to get rid of that and I'll generate a new couch. So I'm just going to come here and, you know, more or less decide where my couch is going to be, kind of following the perspective. I don't have to be too precise, but at the same time, I want to have the general perspective of that couch and maybe I can move it a little bit. And again, I'll type couch, uh, orange couch, I think is what we typed earlier, orange couch, and I'll hit generate and we'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, Rick, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm having to regenerate the couch if I want to add the orange couch. And I'll show you what to do in case you wanted the old one. So I like this one, but oh, actually I deleted the old one. So if, if so, I'll just explain it. So if you wanted the old one, all you do is basically what I'm going to do here and I'll, I'll explain it. So now we have this new couch generated, but the downside is if, oops, I accidentally deleted one. The downside is that when you do these generations, notice how the panels on the wall here, oops, sorry about that, I zoom way out. Notice how the panels here in the on the wall change. They're not the original, see that? See how they're all different and the original is much different. So that's one of the things I don't like about the gen fill, how those things change. So what I've been doing a lot recently with gen fill is after I generate the object that I like, for example, this couch, what I usually do at this point is select that layer and again, I'll delete the ones that I'm never going to use because why blow up my file size? So I'll select the, the couch that I like, the one that I'm going to use. Then I'm going to go into select and choose um, subject. It'll, it'll select that subject. And I'm just going to delete this mask. And there it is. Now I have my panels back. See that the, the original background is there and which is what I want. And then I can go in here and then just smooth out the edges. I'll, I'll, oops, sorry about that. I'll zoom in so that you can see what I'm talking about, zooming out, uh, smoothing the edges. So this is without smooth, this is with smooth. So I like to smooth the edges a bit so they're not so jagged, and that looks much better. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to paint, paint with white here at the bottom because I do want to get that shadow and I do want to get some of that reflection that's appearing on the floor. So that's okay for me to get, but I want to keep the back panel. So now I'm, I'm merging the reflection that's appearing underneath the couch, the shadow, but I am keeping the original wall because I think that just looks better. Now, earlier I mentioned that if I hadn't uh, I think uh, who asked that question? Was it you, Rick? Uh, I think Rick asked the question if you you whether you had to regenerate the couch in order to match the reflection. I wouldn't regenerate re, uh, regenerate the couch. What I would do is maybe make a selection underneath the couch like so. 
and then just click on generative fill, click on generate, and we'll see if it generates the reflection of the, of the couch on the floor. I'm hoping that it does. And if it doesn't, just keep trying. <laughs> um, or you can fake it the, the old school way by flipping it and distorting the couch. But I'm hoping that that Photoshop will actually gen uh, uh, generate the reflection. Yeah, so it did a, a fairly decent job here with the reflection of the couch. You just have to figure out which reflection you like best. And again, I'll probably will do the same thing where I would, um, you know, hide everything by filling with black on that layer mask and maybe selectively painting with white where the couch would reflect. And that's probably what I would do uh, in that case. But if you're planning ahead, you kind of have to think about like, what should I generate first? And in order to have like a layer stack that makes sense. And definitely Anika, fake it till you make it. <laughs> um, but yeah. And the great thing about this technique is that you can apply it to other things like that. We already have like this reflective floor, like this mirror floor. So now if I come in here and I'm like, you know what? It might be nice if we had a table or something here. So I don't know, like we can put a table here and I'm just going to, type in wooden table and we'll see what comes up. Hopefully something that looks good in this room. And yes, it did block out the window reflection. I'm glad you pointed that out, Rick. Um, the couch uh, blocked out the window reflection because that's what it would happen, right? So we have, I don't know which tables, I don't know if I like any of these tables, but you know, for the sake of time, we're gonna say that this table is amazing and it's, it's the most beautiful one and the one that we want in this room. And even though there is a reflection, we can see a little bit of the window reflection. Maybe I want to have a more reflective table. Well, I can select this mirror layer, press Control J to duplicate and drag this guy up. By the way, don't drag things up. I'm dragging because I'm teaching. But if I were working and not talking, what I would have done is press Control Shift in the right bracket key. And that jumps that layer to the very top of the layer stack. So Control or Command on the Mac and the bracket keys, which are to the right of the letter P in North American keyboards, that keyboard shortcut allows you to move layers up and down the layer stack. See that? Control, right bracket moves the layer up. Control, left bracket moves the layer down. And if you hold the shift key as you do that, you'll just jump it all the way to the top or all the way to the bottom by holding uh, Control, Shift, left bracket all the way to the bottom. Control, Shift, right bracket all the way to the top. So you don't need to drag layers up and down. When I'm really working, I have two monitors. I have a monitor here on my left, which is where I'm reading my chat. And I have the monitor on the right where I'm working. And sometimes I may have a panel here, like the layers panel or something. And it'll take forever for me to drag all the way to the left and then all the way to the right to like continue working. So use those keyboard shortcuts. Anyway, now that we have this layer here on top, I can just clip it to the layer below by holding Control Alt G. A clipping mask simply means that the current layer, the layer that's in blue right now, the layer that's selected, that layer, that layer's visibility is controlled by the layer directly below the table. But notice how the table is actually a giant square, this square right here. That's that's what it is. So what we can do now is do the same trick we did earlier. We can select that layer, go into select subject. And it should select the table. It doesn't select the entire table, but that's fine. What I can do now is simply use the quick selection tool, uncheck sample all layers, and just sample the current layer that's selected and continue adding to that selection. Hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac to subtract from the selection. And at this point, you can delete that layer mask and apply the new layer mask uh, but with that selection, my mask was not perfect, unfortunately, but that's okay. With white, I can paint in the areas that, you know, didn't work. And there we go. We have now just the table with the original floor. That table was not casting any, any shadows, really. Um, so then I can just... Actually, you know what? I kind of like the... We'll, we'll have to work with that. Um, so I kind of like the way it did... Actually, no, I like the original... I'm, I'm having trouble deciding what I like better. So that's the original, and that is the, the, the one without the reflections. Whatever, we'll stay with the original. The point is, is that we now have this reflective surface on top of the, the table, and I don't need this on, on the entire table. I don't, I don't need the reflection on the legs and all of that. I just need it on the on the tabletop. So what I'm going to do is fill with black and then paint with white. Oops, uh, let me get a soft brush here. I could have used the keyboard shortcut shift and the left bracket key. And I'm just going to paint in wherever I want that reflection. And again, I can adjust the intensity. Maybe I don't want it as intense as the floor, 
but you get the idea. Now I get a little bit more of that reflection on there. Um, and yeah, right. Those are the struggles, Anika, definitely. And yeah, let me know what you guys think about this technique. We showed how to rotate a room, how to create reflections using Gen Fill, a couple keyboard shortcuts that I hope that you find useful. I know this was a quick 25 minutes, but I have to let you guys go. There's another great stream coming up right after me. Leave your comments in the chat. I always go back and read. I apologize if I miss one of your questions, but yeah, let me know if you enjoy it. Thank you so much. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.